Well, does it really make a difference to, to be a Christian? Even with the joy of becoming a Christian, we soon find that we face discouragements. Uh, we still struggle with the presence of sin in our, in our lives. And we still experience suffering and groaning and dying. And we pray for a long list of people there who are in hospital or got chronic conditions. And in truth, if we prayed for everyone with bad health conditions, we'd pretty much cover most people in the room. We're all groaning. We're all experiencing suffering and death awaits. So does it really make a difference to be a Christian? If Christians are suffering and groaning and dying and struggling with sin, does it make a difference? Well, the Apostle Paul deals with these issues in Romans chapter 8. These very issues that dishearten and discourage us. And last week we began in Romans chapter 8, looking at the first four verses, and we'll continue today. But So have your Bibles open, it'll really help. Uh, over the first kind of um, chunk of text, probably the first 17 verses, I think, he deals with the issue of this struggle with the sinful nature that we still experience. And ironically, godly Christians, as they mature in faith, might be even more acutely aware of the presence of pride and of sin in their thoughts and actions and speech, perhaps even more than someone who's just become a Christian. And so we find ourselves echoing words a bit like seven, chapter 7, verse 24. What a wretched man or what a wretched woman I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? And then he goes on. But thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. So we've got this interesting tension in our lives. We're, we're aware of the struggle with sin and it kind of makes us almost despair. And yet there's this wonderful message. Thanks be to God who delivers us through our Lord Jesus Christ. And in a sense, Romans chapter 8 is working out and showing us the nature of that deliverance helping us to understand that deliverance in our lives. Of all that God is, has accomplished through his Son, and, and it's just a, it's a chapter full of wonderful assurances if you've come today and you're feeling a bit low as a Christian. So last week we looked at the first four verses, and in summary we could think uh, about all that is ours in Christ. Freedom from the condemning penalty of sin. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Absolutely glorious. I hope you applied that to your hearts in the last week. We're freed from con the condemning penalty of sin. We're also freed from the enslaving power of sin. As he talks of being um, set free. Uh, set free from the law of death and sin. And verse 4, we are freed to live righteously by the Spirit. I perhaps didn't spend as much time on this last week, but the whole purpose of God sending His own Son into the world, we learned last week, is that He would be a sin offering. Uh, there is now no condemnation for our sinful flesh because God condemned it in the death of His own Son. And the purpose of that is in verse 4. Look at verse 4. In order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us, who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. We're freed from the condemnation of our sinful flesh, freed from the enslaving power of sin, so that we're freed to live righteously by the Spirit. Now, does it make a difference to be a Christian? Well, all the difference in the world, clearly. But I suppose the question comes to a thoughtful person. Well, but how do I know if that's true for me? How, how do I know that I am genuinely in Christ? How, how do I know um, that I'm the real deal? Well, the answer given in these verses verses 5 and onwards, is 
when God's Holy Spirit lives in you, you know. The evidence that you're in Christ is that God's Holy Spirit lives in you. Okay, okay, all right. So, but how do I know I've got God's Holy Spirit in me? Well, I think verses 5 to 8 really help us uh, see the answer. As the apostle elaborates and uh, he shows the logic of the transformation that God's Spirit brings. And we see a big contrast in these verses. I hope you heard it. It was read so well to us. The big contrast of living uh, according to the flesh, uh, this life that, uh, that every human being has because we're in Adam, and then living according to the Spirit uh, that comes from being born again in Christ. So there's this incredible contrast. Well, in Adam... Our, our, fl- our flesh, our sinful nature, we could never fulfill the righteous requirement of the law, he says. Now, why is that? Well, look at verse 5. Look at the, the fundamental difference in verse 5 is in our minds. Look at verse 5. Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. See, some people have their minds set on the flesh, what the flesh desires. Now, what's the flesh? The flesh is not just kind of the uh, the crime section of the newspaper. It, It also includes all the supplements about business and sport and fashion and homes and holidays and money and relationships. It's the whole of life pursued without a thought for God. All the stuff that we are naturally preoccupied with in living our lives in this world, but all of it without any thought of God whatsoever. That's what it is to be in in the flesh. While others have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. They demonstrate what it means to be in the Spirit. They live in the same world, as everybody else, they care about all the practical stuff in life, but always in relation to God. They also care about business, you see, and sport and fashion and homes and holidays and money and relationships, but their thinking is God-centered rather than self-centered. That they see behind the creation a creator who is worthy to be worshipped and served in everyday life. They hunger to know God and what's in his word. What pleases God pleases them. They care about food and clothes and houses, but they seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. That's what it means to be in the spirit. So what's your mind set? What's your mind set on today? It reveals a lot. It reveals whether the spirit of God lives in you or not? What is it that dominates your thoughts? What drives you forward? What, what preoccupies your thinking, your interests? What are you passionate about? What stirs your emotions? What do you find yourself talking about? This, this reveals some very fundamental things about you, and it tells you about your relationship with God, and it tells you actually about your future. Because you look at verse 6, there's also these two different states that are in contrast. The mind governed by the flesh is death. But the mind governed by the spirit, well, it's life and peace. See, why does the non-Christian go through life with no regard for God? Well, Paul says, because the mind of the flesh is death, spiritual death. I meet lots of wonderful people in Edinburgh. In, in, In so many ways, they're full of creativity and life but they don't want to talk about Jesus. If he gets mentioned, he's a swear word or an exclamation or a frustration. They do not praise God. They've got no desire to read the Bible, no desire to attend church. They just get on with their lives without any regard for God. When it comes to God, they are as insensitive and unresponsive as a corpse. And they go through life blind to see God's handiwork in all of creation, and they are deaf to his word. I'll never forget the evening that I invited some uh, of my, uh, when I was, I was a 
I was, first trade was dentistry. I studied dentistry at the London Hospital uh, in uh, Whitechapel there. And um, I invited a bunch of pals to a carol service, a bunch of my friends on the course. And, you know, you, you kind of go in gulping. You just think, I hope it's a really good one because I've really gone out on a limb inviting these people. And the night was brilliant. There was an orchestra and they were in tune. That's precious, isn't it? And um, the, uh, the carols singing was amazing. It, it was brilliant singing. And the person who did the talk did a fantastic talk. It was biblical. There was no jargon. It wasn't cringy. Uh, he has brilliant illustrations. He, he just conveyed the good news of Christmas and the coming of Jesus. It was fantastic. And he shared about how, how, how we could be right with him because of him heading to the cross. And on the way out, I, I, I asked my, f- my friends, I said, you know, what did you think? What did you think of the event? And I remember one girl turned to me. She said, I did not understand a single thing he said. Brilliant, intelligent people, but completely spiritually dead. And if they continue through life like that, their destiny will be eternal death under the condemnation of God. And so how completely different when you meet a born-again, spirit-transformed person. They're spiritual life. They're alive to God. They've got a deep joy and peace in Christ. You know, I'm sure you've had this experience. You meet a new person, and as you chat to them, you, you start thinking, oh, this, they're a bit different, this person. Is it their attitudes, their words? There's something about them, and you think to yourself, oh, I wonder if they're a Christian. You know, I bet they were a Christian. We shouldn't bet, really, but I mean, I, I bet that they're a Christian. And so you, what you do is you just drop in something about Jesus, and, and then you see their face light up. Oh, you know Jesus. Yeah, I know Jesus. There's life. Two types of minds, two types of states, and and two types of conduct. If you look at verses 7 and 8. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. Now, what is God's law? Jesus summarized it with uh, the great commandment, didn't he? Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. So it's obvious, isn't it? The person in the flesh cannot please God. Their minds are hostile to God. Now, you might say, well, I've got some friends and uh, they're not Christians. They're not hostile to God. They're just sort of, you know, not interested. But they're not hostile. They might even occasionally talk to me about, you know, there be something out there. They might even come to church every now and again. They, they've got their own view of God and, and perhaps they've had an experience of God in some way. They don't seem hostile. But I would suggest to you that if you want to ask them to read the Bible with you, and suggest that they start conforming their lives to what the Bible says. If you call them to acknowledge the lordship of Jesus over different aspects of their lives, I think you'll find that there is indeed hostility. People don't want to live their life in accordance with God. They're not interested to hear about what pleases God or how they could obey his words. And I think this is a clear place in the Bible that teaches us about the inability of us as humans in our own strength to ever respond positively to God. You see, as we look to share the good news with others, I'm so excited about passion for life and what's coming. We need to be clear in our minds, it's not just a matter of education. You know, they don't know if they hear it'll be straightforward. So I just need to give them the facts. And we, of course, need to give people the facts, help them to know. Uh, It's not just simply that we need to persuade them it's true. It's not even that we just need to show them how attractive it is. That then that will totally change their minds. We all start spiritually hostile to God. We don't want to hear. We don't want to submit. There's no desire in us ever to respond positively to God. So is it hopeless? 
Well, left to ourselves, it really is hopeless. And that's why when we do our groups, we're going to also be praying. Because what's hopeless with us is something that is possible with God. Um, Ezekiel, uh, in his vision, I'm reading through Ezekiel in my morning Bible readings at the moment. He uh, is taken and sees a valley of, of, of dead and lifeless bones. And uh, God asks him, can these bones live? And he says, well, you know, you know Lord, you alone know, no, Lord. And he, he's told to prophesy to the breath. And the Spirit of God comes into this valley of dry bones and suddenly uh, bones come together, ligaments and flesh, and up on their feet and breath goes in them and, a, and an army comes alive. And actually, this is what we all need. We're all spiritually dead. We're hostile to God. We don't want to please God. And we need the Spirit of God to do this transforming work in our lives. This is not something that the flesh can achieve. But when God's Spirit comes in, everything changes. Minds change. Now minds set on what the Spirit desires. Spiritual state change. It leads to life and peace. Real spiritual life. Eternal life. The wage of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life and there's a new conduct as things begin to change we're now able to please God we've got a new desire motivation to to head in that direction it makes all the difference in the world to be in Christ in Christ we are freed to live righteously by his spirit how do you know you're in Christ that you're free from God's condemnation by the presence of God's Spirit in your life. I hope it's helped diagnose for you where you're at today. This fundamental contrast between the, these two states of flesh and spirit, it's, it's night and day, isn't it? Different mind, different state, different conduct. And then the Apostle Paul turns to apply this to the church in Rome in, uh, in verses 9 to 11. You, and in the original language that's plural, you, the church, you, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. From everything that Paul's heard about this group in church in Rome, he's, he hasn't visited it yet, he's hoping to visit it, he can say, yeah, you've, you've got the Spirit. Um, I guess like every church, this would be read out in church, there's a mixture of people of church who are people who are Christians and people who are not Christians, and that's where you've got that little qualifier, if indeed the Spirit of God lives in you. But do you see, if the Spirit of God lives in you, just means that you're a regular Christian. This, this description of flesh and spirit is not between two types of Christians. Uh, if your mind is hostile to God, you're not a Christian, are you? You cannot be a Christian without God's Spirit making you born again. It's just not possible. And to have the Spirit of God means that you have Christ in you. So the first four verses are this wonderful thought that actually uh, all these blessings are ours in Christ. And then, he, and then he shares this equally wonderful thing to, to, that they could know that the Spirit of Christ is in them. And that just changes everything. Um, it's wonderful what we have here, a little bit of a uh, little doctrine of the Holy Spirit here. If you look at uh, verses uh, 9 to 11... Uh, the Spirit is described as the Spirit, the Spirit of God. And then if you read on, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, uh, uh, but, and then he speaks of Christ living in you. Now here's one of the wonderful things that we wrestle with as we read the Bible, that there is only one God, and yet he exists in three persons, Father, Son, and Spirit. Each person distinct, and yet eat each mutually indwelling each other so that you cannot see the one without the three. You cannot see the three without the one. And so if you have the Spirit of God, it means you have the Spirit of Christ in you. And if you have the Spirit of Christ, that means you have Christ in you. What an amazing thing to be a Christian. Not only that I'm in Christ, but that Christ is in me by His Spirit. 
And the Apostle Paul has no doubt about these people in the church in Rome. The Spirit of God lives in you, verses 10 to 11. But if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. So we see transformed minds now in verses 5 to 8. And this wonderful promise of transformed bodies to come in verses 9 to 11. So the Christian lives his life still, in a sense, living in this body that's linked to Adam, affected by the curse of Adam's sin. These, uh, these bodies which uh, still have this sinful nature that still pulls us back to living life as if we were the center of the universe rather than God. There's still that pull in us to be egocentric and selfish. We, we, we feel the pull to sinful behavior that does not please God. And because we're in these bodies that are linked to Adam, then we live in a world of decay and death. Vacuum the house week, this week. Will you vacuum the house? Do it, do it. Husbands, do it for your wives. They love it, right? And uh, I've got one of these vacuumless, uh, bagless vacuums, and you have to empty the thing. And, and you empty all this gray... Ugh. It was all in the carpet. Whoa. It's incredible how much my Hoover picks up. I can tell you what it is later, but... And you empty it in it. Do you know what most of that is? That's your skin. You're flaking and dying as you vacuum it up. This is an encouraging thought, isn't it? That's, that's, that's what it is to be in the flesh. It's flaking away on the carpets. It's reminding you, you are dying. But even as we're aware of our bodies experiencing disease, decay, and physical death, and that would make us dis- very despairing, that's all we focused on. If we think about the pull of sin, that's discouraging. Here are two amazing truths to encourage you this week. We are in Christ. So there's no condemnation. And Christ is in us by his Holy Spirit. There is spiritual life in our minds and our inner being, in our souls. And that very presence of the Spirit will guarantee a real physical resurrection body like Jesus. Just think about the spiritual life that's in us. Now, if you are here today and you're someone who's actually trusted Jesus Christ, remember, remember that, that change that came about. Remember how your desires began to change. You actually start caring about God. You, you repented of your sins. You joyfully trusted Jesus Christ. You started enjoying coming to church. You enjoyed singing these songs. You became hungry to read the Bible, hungry to hear God's word preached. Um, You began to pray in a new and intimate way to God. You knew that through trusting Jesus that you had peace with God. You experienced this new peace with yourself, within yourself and with others. So these, I want to say to you, if you experience any of those things, these are not ordinary, normal things. If you've experienced any of these things, this is a supernatural work of God's grace, of his Holy Spirit in your life. And if that Spirit of God is at work in your life today, then it guarantees that you will not only have a, trans- that you have a transformed mind now, but you will have a transformed body to come. That's what he says. If you look at uh, 8, verse 11, clap your eyes on that again. And if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead, is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit who lives in you. Do you know, ultimately, the destiny of our bodies is not death, but resurrection. The same Spirit who raised Jesus that first Easter will raise us. The same Spirit who gives us spiritual life now will give resurrection life to our physical bodies. So do you know today if the Spirit of God lives in you? Do you see the difference it makes that you are a Christian? If you're sitting here today and you're thinking, actually, I don't know, I don't know what you're talking about. This has not been my experience. The very fact that you're in church encourages me. 
It suggests to me that maybe the God Spirit is beginning to work in your life. And you're sitting there and you're thinking, I, I, I could never be a Christian. I've got some Christian friends. I, I could never be like them. I just, I just can't imagine it. Well, of course you can't be a Christian like them if you don't have the Spirit of God. But when you give your life to Christ, His Spirit will come in you and you will change. You will be changed. And I would say to you today, if you don't know what I'm talking about today, call out to God to have mercy on you today. Ask him to change you by his Holy Spirit, to come into your life so that you can know him and trust Jesus. And my Christian friends, I hope the reflection on these scriptures today will give you great joy. Even if you're coming in wrestling from the spiritual fight, if you're coming in discouraged because your body is aching and sore and there's diseases that are not going away, The Spirit of God is in you. You are in Christ. And Christ, by His Spirit, is in you and will be with you today, this week, and for all eternity. Let's praise Him, shall we?